So after the, um, the LHD project, the underground truck project, we started to venture into some different areas. Up until that time, we'd just been focused on mining, uh, which is why the kind of group was created in the first place. But it was suggested to us that uh, mining goes, you know, in peaks and troughs and we should be a bit more diverse. So we started to explore new things, uh, one of which was uh, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, or pe as people now call them, drones. So back in 1999, we bought our first uh, radio controlled helicopter. Um, so just after the underground truck project finished, we um, started trialing, flying these, um, these radio controlled helicopters. And um, I ended up accidentally being the test pilot for those, um, for those first experiments. So I had to teach myself to fly radio controlled helicopters, um, all at CSIRO on work time. So, I mean, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad gig. Um, so, you know, we would spend quite a few months every day just, you know, learning the ropes of flying these helicopters and kind of installing um, vision systems on there and computer systems. Uh, and generally trying to work out how you can get one of these helicopters, which up until that time had been radio controlled, to fly by themselves. Uh, and at the same time, we started to develop a um, submarine system as well with our colleagues at QUT. So a, a student at QUT developed uh, our, our first submarine, which was known as COD. Uh, it was known as COD purely because um, when it was manufactured, um, it actually said cash on delivery. They had this COD symbol stuck on the side. Um, you can actually see this. It's, it's still hanging up in the ceiling space out at CSIRO. I think it's even got the COD symbol stuck on it. Um, so anyway, that very first submarine, um, again, we started, we tested it in the creek out at CSIRO uh, and at one of our technicians swimming pools. Uh, he lived nearby, so we went and tested that out. So we started to explore this, you know, UAVs and submarines uh, and generally kind of build those projects up. And it was about that time that Matthew Dumbabin um, arrived at CSIRO and he very much took on the submarine, the submarine work. Uh, and really started to build that up and developed uh, a whole fleet of different submarines called Starbug at the time. Um, and I worked, at that time, I actually worked with Matt on some of the, um, the software systems for those submarines um, while I was kind of leading the, um, the UAV project. So I kind of kept feed in both, you know, in both of those projects. Okay, some of the challenges. <clears throat> So the challenges back in the day um, were both with the submarine work actually and the UAV work were um, how do you measure the orientation of the robots, right? So, um, you know, in order to control the flying robots, you need to know what angle they're at. And the same even with submarines, you kind of need to know what angle they're at. And um, up until that time, you could get, you could get sensors um, that would measure that, but they were very large and very expensive. So we had to build our own, right, from scratch. It's funny to think now everybody's phone has these sensors, uh, this type of sensor built in. So when you use your phone and you can, you know, measure angles and things, it's those kind of sensors. So, you know, these are accelerometers and gyroscopes and magnetometers, all these sensors that are now very familiar to people in phones, back then were hard. So we had to buy the raw sensors and kind of integrate them into a package and make our own, um, it's, it's what's known as a inertial navigation system. So it's literally a device that allows you to measure the angles of things. So that was the real challenge. How do you get that shrunk down into a small package that you could actually put in, in these robots? So we, yeah, we developed a system called the EMU, um, which was this, uh, this very small embedded IMU, hence the EMU name. One of the things I want to bring out is <coughs> so you guys are you're building hardware and accompanying yeah. software from scratch. It's yes, not, no. It's nothing off the shelf. No, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're always trying to push the boundary uh, with, um, with the hardware and the software development. And then we would, of course, hope that somebody, eventually the, the technology would kind of catch up with what we've been doing, and then we could just go and buy it. That was the aim. Um, that we had dreams of maybe we could sell it and kind of, you know, create companies to make this, but I think we were somewhat naive in that way. Uh, you know, there are big corporations that can do that. 
um, and they did. Um, so, you know, so eventually we could replace all our homegrown stuff with an off-the-shelf stuff, but we had a sort of advantage with everybody else who didn't have it yet because we could have, we've developed all the stuff around it that would use this future system. So it was always about pushing the envelope with the hardware and software. 